Hello, everybody. This is the one and only Mr. LP, Stephen Sykes of Live and Global Media, sponsored by the Crossland Coleman Group. And we're here Monday on November the 6th, 2017. And we are live. We got a wonderful and great guest today. And I'm always in the practice of letting people announce their names because I think it's so powerful when people speak their names instead of saying, hi, I got whatever. So today I have the wonderful, the talented, and just the ultra rich. Emma Medeiros. Hello, Ms. Medeiros. How are you doing? Oh, yes. I am the owner of Medeiros Fashion PR, which is the first public relations firm in the U.S. to specialize in the plus size fashion industry. Awesome. Well, we're glad to have you um, on with us today. First and foremost, please tell us for those who are not familiar in things, oh, you know, who haven't seen your name and lights as they should. Uh, tell us, <laughs> tell us uh, where are you from, ma'am? So I'm originally from Rhode Island. Um, I live in Boston right now. I've lived in Boston for about eight years, mm -hmm. and hopefully I do. Uh, hopefully I will be moving to New York, possibly the spring, summer. We'll see. Because as much as I love Boston, and I do, I really do. Shout out to my Bostonies. Um, when it comes to the fashion industry, I'm there's there's no comparison. Sorry, uh -huh. sorry, but you know, I'm there's so much more opportunity. You know, with Boston, it's a very conservative, old school old money town, let's think about it for 20 years before we make a decision. You know, they're <laughs> very, like, change is a dirty word. Dirty word. Four-letter word. Uh, versus New York, that's like, yay, it's fun, it's new, let's do it. You know, so it's a different, it's a different atmosphere. They both have their pros and cons, but when it comes to the fashion industry, definitely New York, so that's the plan. Uh, totally understand. So now we're gonna uh, we're gonna try to shield you from all the people that feel like you know traitor for Rhode Island. Yeah. Oh my goodness! I love my roadies. Before. I love my roadies. You know. Uh, so what part of Rhode Island? What's that? What part of Rhode Island? Uh, Creston, Warwick area. Yeah, and my family, uh, my family still lives there. And it's so funny that when I told my mother I was moving to Boston, you know, an hour away. Keep in mind, one hour. She goes, "You're moving." To Boston? I, I wish I had a camera. Her face was priceless. But to a Rhode Islander, you know, 20 minutes is a long time to drive. So an hour, my God, I'll never see my child again. It was, oh my God, it was hysterical. So, I mean, she's kind of gotten over that now. But I'm like, yes, Boston, not Japan. <laughs> not Japan, mother. That, that, that's how, you know, that they don't see it. They feel like it's another planet. Like, so New York, oh my gosh, she still can't quite wrap her head around New York yet, but she'll get there. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about, you know, you growing up and things. Like, you're obviously a very warm and energetic and loving, and, you know, you have a great business mind. Tell us a little bit about growing up. What, did, did all this fashion, was fashion and marketing and social media, was this just your passion from the jump and things, or what was it, you know, your I wish I could thing? say that. I wish I could say that. Oh my gosh, I will, there are some photos of me when I was young that my husband said, never show anyone in the fashion industry. Nah, come on. Never. That's what you know, that's so, that's so. All, Like, until, oh my gosh, it's, I mean, I look back, I'm like, oh my god, burn that thing. It was awful. Well, I mean, I was, oh, let me think. I mean, I'm 5'10". I'm half German. I'm a big girl without the weight or not, without the weight. I was a 12, uh, when I was 12 years old, I was already a D-cup bra, mm. right? And teenage boys are teenage boys. I got to, you know, they weren't mean. They weren't abusive or anything like that. They just never talked to my face. They talked to my chest. Mm -hmm. And growing up, you know, Catholic, traditional, all of that it just made me very uncomfortable. So I was really self-conscious about my body. I would wear these big baggy shirts. I have an older brother who's like six years older than me. I'd wear his big shirts that were like two sizes too big. I'd wear these like god awful turtlenecks and overalls and bag just anything. Anything to hide my chest and curves and you know and now it's so funny. I look back I'm like what was I so afraid of? Mm. I've just I've become so much more comfortable in my own skin. So I think it was probably when probably when I get to college the first time around because I actually had two um college experiences. So when I first got out of college, uh, out of high school, I wanted to be a music major, actually. I was in three choruses, mu uh, marching band and everything. Music is a huge part of my life. My mother's a music a music teacher. I just, that's what I wanted to do. I loved what music. Instrument? Yep. What instrument? Actually, I sing. Yep. Oh, oh, you were singing in the marching band? I, no, well, in the marching band, I was actually one of the girls with the flags and the dancing. Oh, oh okay, gotcha. Uh, gotcha. But I was in three choruses. I loved my choruses and everything like that. And I still do. I still love to sing as a hobby. It just wasn't what I wanted to do as a profession. 
so I was in college for a couple of years and I'm like not really what I wanted to do take a step back took some time off I got kind of into the fashion and beauty industry I actually got my aesthetics license this is still in Rhode Island um, so I went to beauty school I learned how to do all about skincare and that brought me to Sephora are you familiar with Sephora? Do you know what Sephora is? Okay. Um, so Sephora is really the mecca of beauty. I mean, skincare and makeup, fragrance, hair care, you name it. Um, so I was actually there for 10 years. Um, I just quit last October when I was ready to do Madeira's Fashion PR full-time. It was wonderful. So you're, so, you're, so you're 27. You've been working since you were 17. Sure, let's go with that. <laughs> I'm actually 36. Uh, yep, I'm 36. But all that skincare stuff at Sephora, let me tell you, you know, it's not just... It's, doing something right. <laughs> yes, I am 36. Um, so I, like I said, I had two rounds in college. So I took some time off after my first round in college. I was maybe 20. Um, I got my skincare license. I ended up working for Sephora eventually. A couple of jobs in between that, but I ended up working for Sephora. And then when I was 26, 27, something like that, I was like, I want to go back to school. I want to get my degree. You know, I really... I just wanted to do that for myself. It wasn't even like for a job purpose. I just wanted to do that for myself. That was important. Um, so I was like, what do I really, you know, what am I interested in? So I looked at the options. I was like marketing, you know, I've been in retail for a while. I'm good with customers. Um, I know how to sell essentially. Even, you know, I've had bosses that say Emma can sell ice to an Eskimo. That's a, that's a cool, you know, that's a cool compliment. Um, so I know how to understand the features and benefits about a product or service and really translate it to the customer based on what they need. Because you speak to customers differently, of course, based on what they need. You know, you're not going to talk to a 20-year-old college student. You're not going to sell this a, a product the same way to her as you are a 45-year-old single mom. Yes, ma'am. You, you have to understand your customer. And that's, you know, a huge part of what I do as a PR. Um, so I ended up going back to school at Emerson College, which is in Boston. So I went to... Um, Emerson, I got my degree in Integrated Marketing Communications, that's the official title, and I graduated in 2012, and I got married that same um, that same spring, same summer, which is right behind me again. We had a Renaissance-themed wedding. It was so much fun. I had a purple wedding dress. We had a cake that was a castle. We cut it with a real sword. Oh, you know, my. Was, I, don't, I don't do anything half-assed, let me tell you. When I do something, I do something. Go big, so go big, go home. It was so much fun. Go big or go home, exactly. My nephews, they were our ring bearers. They were little knights. Oh, it was so much fun. Yeah, we read from scrolls, the priest dressed up, the, the guests dressed up. It was so much fun. Yeah, you can see my pictures on the, on Facebook as well. Um, it, it, I had to kind of sell the idea to my conservative Catholic family. They were like, I'm sorry, you want to do what? Like, what, you're not wearing a white dress? Like, it, it, it was a very fun. So how is it with the, you know, with conservative family? It, it, it begs two questions. Yeah. Uh, the first one is, you know, you being the energetic, you experiencing life, you going out there, making it and things, where does the rebel side of it, and you know, it's not rebel. It is. Um, it, it's to you, to you and I and the rest of the world, it's not rebel, but to a family an like that, it would rebel. be rebel. They, they, it's, I mean, I have the best family in the world. I, I could not ask for a better family. I, Even though my parents are separated, they've both been always, you know, really great at raising my brother and I together, you know, they, I don't, they always believed in me, always, 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 even if they didn't agree with what I was doing, right, they're like, okay, we'll try to understand it, my father especially, again, is super conservative, if he had his way, I'd, you know, stay at home till I was married, do the really, you know, everything, if he had his way, you know, that's just what he preferred, but I, I God bless him, because even though he didn't necessarily agree with some of my choices, he understood them. And he understands now that it was right for me. Uh, my mother has always been a little bit more um, progressive, and I had to remind her of that when I moved to Boston, or when I wanted to move to Boston. <laughs> I said, Mom, you were the one, no joke, this is exactly what she said. I said, Mom, you were the one who told me to go for my dreams, live, you know, do whatever I want. She goes, you know what she says? She goes, yeah, but I met in Rhode Island. I was like... <laughs> Well, you did not specify. The contract did not say that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I really, I mean, I have the best family in the world, the best husband in the world. I mean, you know, it's amazing to have a supportive husband and friends. I mean, obviously, my husband is much more involved than my family and whatever. But ever since launching Madeira's Fashion PR, and especially since quitting Sephora and doing this full time, 
I don't always have the same amount of income coming in, you know, in the month. And not once, not once has he ever said, you can't do this. You should go back to Sephora. You should get a regular job. Not once. He's like, okay, how can we make this work this month? And how can we, like, we just make it work because he believes in me and he supports it. It's just, can't say enough about my hubby, Adam. I really can't. I just, and it makes all the difference in the world. And the thing is, I know not everyone has that. I know not everybody has that support system. So to entrepreneurs out there that, you know, want to do something and don't necessarily have the amazing support that I have, I would really suggest going to, looking into different resources. Like, for example, there's a nonprofit in my area called Center for Women in Enterprise, CWE. Um, it's available, I think, in New England mainly, but there are other options like it in different parts of the country. I, I cannot say enough about them. I mean, they're a nonprofit that helps women and minorities because women are considered a minority. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are other, obviously, definitions of minorities. But basically, anybody who's like wants to start their own business, how do I get the funding? What do I do legally? What do I do? I mean, there's all sorts of things to do when mm -hmm. starting a business. You know, being a publicist is one thing and being a businesswoman is another. So what uh -huh. I definitely suggest to everybody, you know, who wants to be an entrepreneur, know your resources. Google how to start up a business in Boston, in Atlanta, wherever you are. There are so many resources, free and very inexpensive out yeah. there. I mean, even if you don't have the amazing family support that I have, there are people to help you that want to help. Go to your library, your public library, your librarians, resource librarians. My God. I'm like, how do you know all this? I mean, they're such amazing resources. It's, it takes the opportunity to read. Yeah. Uh, before, the other question I was going to ask you, I had it would brought a couple of more. One, I was going to tease you. I said, you know, when you get to New York, you're going to have a big fight between on seafood and especially clam chowder oh. from New England. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, if, if it's in Boston, chow da. Not chow da. Chow da. <laughs> chow da. Excuse me. Yes, on that. Now, you mentioned German, and I want to uh, ask about that in in terms of like in different cultures, we all, one thing in all the cultures is business and family and communication. Um, and especially, you know, and then having been in Germany and lived in there. Oh, you yeah. have? Oh, I didn't know that. Cool. Yeah, for a little bit doing some work. You know, and, um, and taking that heritage and of course, unfortunately, you know, the Holocaust and a lot of other different things that's happened in our history. How's that, how did the uh, family heritage and history with that in terms of business and the concept, how does that play into the role in terms of your family, your upbringing, upbringing, excuse me, and then forwarding along and towards business? Hmm, as far as business, I'm not really sure in my case that it had whole lot to do with it because even though yes I'm half German I I never lived there I was never super involved in the culture I can say that it's affected me body wise because I am 5'10 I've got the broad shoulders the broad hips the big boobs and so that has kind of set the stage for being in the plus size industry and being in that sort of thing um, I mean I think it's more of not necessarily me being German, but one thing that my family in general has always really instilled in me is accountability, mm. you know, taking responsibility for your own actions, taking, you know, pride in your work, worth, work ethic. One thing about me that not a lot of people know is that I have bipolar. I've had bipolar disorder. Are you familiar with that? Do you know what that is? Mm -hmm. Okay. So to people who are not, basically, <clears throat> just in case. It's a chemical imbalance in your brain that causes you to have severe, uncontrollable mood swings. You have zero control over it. Jekyll and Hyde. I mean, like, I would be on top of the world, happy as anything. All of a sudden, someone would come over and, like, touch my neck. I'd start screaming. I mean, awful. Really awful. And I was like, what is wrong with me? I'm going nuts. And I was 13 when I first started showing symptoms of it. And, of course, at that age pretty much every teenager, age or teenager has some kind of mood swings. You know? right. So the doctors were really like, is she just being a teenager? Is she just being dramatic? You know, what is going on? So it, you know, went to the point where they finally realized, okay, this is more than just being a teenager, you know, and it took a good three years to diagnose me. It was three years. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry that you had awful. to go through. I'm like, everyone kept telling me you're fine. You're just, I'm like, I'm not fine. What is it? You know, this is just, and I give, again, my parents a lot of credit because they didn't just say, 
take the doctor's word for it. Oh, she's fine. She'd be a teenager. They're like, no, this, this is something else here, right? So finally, when I do, was diagnosed at 16, I was started to put on medication. And the thing with bipolar and other mental illnesses like it, there's no x-ray. There's no blood test to prove it. Some people, quite a few people still don't believe that mental illness exists. That's very common. Very so, much. you know, it was very much trial and error to get the right medication, the right dose, the right combination, the right combination of talk therapy as well. It was a long time. It was very hard. And the reason well, why, oh, sorry. Is it no, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, what I want to ask is that, do you feel one, uh, was this a hereditary, it, and, and um, there's a line towards this, uh, but it, was it one, had hereditary, and then two, do you, was it a, uh, because of the fact of your uh, current, your current bodies, I'm sorry, your body image issues at that time, you know, 10, 11, 12, developing so fast, did that bring on and activated it? Do you feel that assisted with yeah. that? I mean, later on when I learned more about the disease, it's common to kind of uh, manifest in the teens to late teens to early 20s. That's usually around the time there's no set age to develop it. Um, as far as, I mean, I was on my way to being plus size anyway, but because the medication made me gain a lot of weight. Well, I meant in terms of like they're dealing with the emotional aspects because all of this, obviously you're dealing with that and, and, and technically undiagnosed, but we've seen it in, and it's different for different people. I don't want to oh, ask this time, yeah. but I want to say that for you, did it become because you were dealing with so much emotional stress of obviously developing fast and then everybody coming into you, did that, Okay, you have it. Did that make it worse? Did that activate it? Did that stress um, it off? I don't. I honestly don't know if that activated it. I'm sure it played into it. Okay. I mean, like I said, it probably just happened to happen at the same time or at the same time. I mean, because I gained a lot of weight from the medication, it you know led to more self consciousness. Okay. Um, but one thing that I I really wanted to say was. I remember complaining to my dad one time, oh, that man, this medication, it makes me tired, it makes me gain weight, blah, blah, you know, kind of self-pity, poor me. He he goes, Emma, you should thank God that there is medication for this. <laughs> you know what? And I thank God to this day that he set me straight because he was right, and he is right. You know, 100 years ago, they didn't know about bipolar. They didn't know about medication. If that had happened to me then, if I lived in that time, I would have been locked up in an insane asylum in a straitjacket. They didn't know what to do with me. Some people, they burn you at the stake. Right? Seriously. I was like, you know what? He's right. And from that moment on, I mean, yeah, once in a while, I kind of felt sorry for myself, but I never let it, like, rule my life. And I remember another significant time, too, at my mother, um, because I was diagnosed when I was a minor, of course, they had to discuss treatment options with my parents. You know, that was the main thing. And I didn't find out this until a good 10 years down the road. And I'm so grateful that I did not. Apparently the doctors, my mother told me later on, they talked to my parents about, okay, so she can go on disability, she can do this, she get these are the options. And my mother, she goes, no, she's not going on disability. She's going to make something out of herself. Mm. And you know what? I, and I say that and some people think that I'm really judgmental by saying that, by saying, oh, no one needs disability. That's not what I'm saying. That is not what I'm saying at all. I want to be okay. really clear on that. Of course, some people need disability. Some people have a much more severe case of it than I did. I understand that. Disability is there for a reason. Some people need it. Obviously, that's not what I'm saying. In my case, she wanted to at least try to get me to not have to do that. Okay. that was, I want to be really clear on that because some people are like, what do you mean? Of course, some people need this. But I'm like, obviously, that's not what I'm saying. In my case my parents really wanted me to not even think that, not even know that was an option because I pushed myself so much harder. I didn't have that pull that, oh, well, if it doesn't work out, I can just go on disability. You know, they didn't want me to think that way. They, I mean, again, disability is there for a reason. Some people genuinely need it. I want to be clear on that. But in my case, I'm so incredibly grateful that they didn't say that to me. I didn't know that was an option. I was 16. I had no idea what that is. So, you know, I read one time a while ago that, only about five to ten percent of people with diagnosed mental illness can lead what's known as a normal life, right? Mm. And I made a promise to myself when I saw that. I said, "I'm going to have a normal life." 
I have, you know, I'm going to work for what I, you know, obviously some people need it, you need it. But in my case, I was able to overcome it with medication, with our talk therapy, with family support. So I encourage people to really try those options before you go on disability. I, I mean, really, because the sense of pride and the sense of accomplishment is so much more it's it's incredible to just des describe it really is i mean whatever your definition of success is whenever you reach that knowing that you pushed yourself and you did it you know obviously take help if you need it take your meds get therapy you know do what you need to do and think now when you you going through this process and and the direction i'm heading in is that you being the responsible to you know god Lord knows we all have our good and bad days. Obviously, but, but you you take the opportunity to be responsible, pushing through, pushing through business. Mm -hmm. And now that you're on this journey of developing, um, you know, a marketing uh, firm, just directly supporting women who are plus size. I want to get your thoughts on a the level of um, obviously you're going through the medica medication, the other therapy, but you exercise, you eat right, uh, things not to try to gain or lose weight, but you're doing it for your own mental and chemical the body health. That plays around what type of work effort, what type of work effort towards your exercising and eating that allow you to be a better businesswoman is where I'm leading towards in balancing the aspect of uh, the bipolar of Um, Let's see. Well, it's definitely hard, you know, anyone who owns their own business knows that the best part about being self-employed is being your own boss. And the worst part, worst part about being self-employed is being your own boss. Because, you know, you, there's no one telling you, you have to be to work at a certain time. You have to get up at a certain time. You have to do this. So you have to develop that discipline, which allows you to be a successful businesswoman, businessman, whatever. Um, so that, I think, plays into being disciplined to exercise and to eat healthier and everything. I did have weight loss surgery um, a few years ago for my health. I've lost about 120 pounds. Congratulations. Uh, one thing, yep. But one, I, so I, deem, I have more to lose, but I'm definitely a lot healthier than I was. One thing that I have had to do um, is start exercising, like doing an actual workout since I've quit Sephora because I was running around five days a week, nine hours a day, so that was my exercise, right? Mm -hmm. So now that I'm essentially sitting on my butt, you know, on the computer, that's the majority of my work, I really have to, for my back, for my legs, for everything like that, actually, you know, keep moving. So that's important, too, to people who are going through a change like that. Because a lot of people do work retail or they work a day job or something like that. And then when you kind of transition into being your own boss, you have to be disciplined about getting up at a certain time, whatever time works for you. Um, in my case, it's actually usually around 10 or 11 in the morning, which to most people is like, what do you mean? That's sleeping in, right? But fashion industry is a night industry mm -hmm. for the most part. So for me, it actually makes more sense to get up later and to be up later at night because most of the people in the fashion industry are online later at night. So, right. I mean, getting back to the whole, you know, bipolar and the, it's more about discipline. Discipline is a really, Important. And I'm still learning that. I am still learning that it's a constant growth period because, you know, it's not a nine to five job PR. There's no such thing as nine to five. It's 24 hours, seven, seven, seven days a week. You do, I've had conference calls at one in the morning, you know, because I've had people in different countries, kinds mm -hmm. of different countries. They need to talk at a certain time. I'm like, Okay, yeah, huh, huh, okay, yeah, totally, I'm on board, okay, click. Make sure you take your notes before we hang <laughs> up the phone, because it's like, like what did I agree to? <laughs> like, oh, we talked last night, did we? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you have to be open to that, you know, and I think that it's really important to not be constrained by other people. Like, my family is very 9 to 5, 8 to 4, whatever. It's, it took them a really long time to understand my schedule you know like my dad comes to boston to visit oh let's go to breakfast at eight i'm like yeah i'll see you for brunch at 12. <laughs> <laughs> but you know in my case you got to do what's right for you yeah no, does that answer your question i know that's kind of like a roundabout way of answering my question but does that answer your question uh, no okay. that's, it does it okay. very much so so now um you're going into <clears throat> the fashion pr what made you feel now you see a lot of women out there promoting and marketing and doing their things for themselves and obviously there's a need for this uh, for what you're doing and things but what made you decide you to do it uh, versus somebody else or just working with somebody individually yeah. what made you decide to develop a business for this well when i gr was graduating emerson i was like okay 
what do I want to be when I grow up sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So I knew I wanted to do public relations because um, underneath the marketing degree that I got, I could have focused on advertising. I could have done PR. There's a whole bunch of things that you can do with that degree. And the reason why I chose to do PR is because it's based on merit instead of money. And what I mean by that is the typical person knows that when you see an ad, whether it's on a billboard, in a magazine, TV, whatever, it is a paid ad, right? Exactly. So whether or not your product or service is any good, if you have the money, you can buy that ad space, right? So the reason why PR is, in my mind, more credible is because it's not based on that. So, for example, if you hire me, if you're a plus-size designer, right, you hire me to reach out to the press, whether it's journalists, bloggers, TV people, whatever, and they're not paid to write about you. They're paid to write a story. They're not paid to write about you specifically. So if they do anyway, it means a lot more in the public mind. It's actually called third-party credibility. Okay. So it means a lot more in the public mind than a paid ad. It's like getting a recommendation from a friend for a movie, a restaurant, whatever. Because you know that friend, they know your interest, that sort of thing. You trust them more than just a paid ad. So that's the reason why I decided to do PR in general. Um, so I was definitely more fashion conscious. I haven't worn overalls in a long time. <laughs> this is not my look. Um, but I was like, okay, the plus size industry is exploding. I'm plus size. I love fashion. Okay, put them together. And I just assumed that because the industry was growing so rapidly, I would have my pick of firms to work for that specialize in the plus size industry. I, I knew I wanted to have my own firm, but I'm like, well, before I have my own thing, let me work for someone else, learn the ropes, you know, that seemed a good plan. And I did a lot of research and I could not find a single one in the US that specialized in plus size. So there are many fashion PR firms, or sometimes they're called lifestyle PR firms in the US that have a lot of fashion clients that may or may not have a couple of plus size, but there were none that actually specialized in it. Okay. The reason why that's important is because my clients know that every single one of my contacts of my resources is relevant to them. I'm not going to waste a single penny of your money or a single minute of my time reaching out to people that don't want to hear about you. So I do have connections at what's called mainstream outlets such as like Essence, Vogue, whatever. But again, my contacts are people that have already talked about plus sizes. You know, have already talked about that. So I'm not reaching out to someone, they're not interested in plus sizes. I mean, everyone should be, but yeah, unfortunately not everyone is. Um, but so my clients know that every resource at my disposal is at their disposal and is relevant to them. So I don't waste any time, money, anything like that, pitching their stories to people that don't want to hear about them. Hmm. That's a that's a great uh, thing, and, and you take the time out to, like you said, you didn't see it, but you did the research, and you're not wasting your time uh, with that type of focus. Yes, you're not wasting your time going to somebody that's just not interested. Exactly. And then when they, then the trick is, as we all know, when they finally do interest, you just charge them three times more. <laughs> exactly. It's like, oh, now you want to hear about now you want to hear. Oh, okay. Well, you know what? That's gonna cost you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it is, it is the pain and suffering tax. <laughs> so you got it. You got it. You got it. Yeah. So now you're making this beautiful transition. Uh, you have a wonderful family, great upbringing. Um, you know, you, you you got a hold of things, and now to uh, it sounds like you're in this like you're already hitting that cruise button. You're ready to go, and you make that big move uh, to New York. What about it now? You and I both know there's a lot of people that do know, and we talked about a little bit obviously of fashion and things, but there's also more than other things that it offers in addition to Boston. And we're not saying this as a dismay to no, Boston, not at all. but what is it about to drive? Uh, because obviously, there's some fashion in Chicago, London, mm -hmm. Paris, LA, Miami, obviously, New York, and Mecca. But what is it specifically for you besides the fashion that draws you to New York? just a sense of possibility. I guess that's the best way to say it. There's always that feeling of optimism, of possibility. I mean, obviously New York has its downsides, you know, just like any other city. Oh my God, you should see my father's face when I said I went to move to New York. I thought he was going to like commit me to a nunnery or something to protect me because he hadn't been to New York since the 80s. So, <laughs> so in his mind, I was going to get raped and or mugged the second I stepped off the bus. Mm -hmm. um, I actually had to call him. Oh, my gosh. The first time I went to New York by myself, he didn't realize I was going by myself. 
<laughs> oh, no, God. I, I made the mistake of telling him that. But um, he asked where I was staying. I said, in Harlem. He's like, Harlem, oh, my God. I mean, like, oh, my gosh. So he may, and which Harlem has changed quite a bit. Yeah. You know, it's changed quite a bit. It's, you know, gentrified a little bit. It's a lot safer than it used to be. So I still remember. I was on the phone with him in my hotel room. And he's like, okay, is the door locked? I'm like, yes, Dad. The door's locked. Are you sure? Yes, Dad. The door's <laughs> locked. He's like, okay. you, you locked the door. Like, on. He actually told me. He said, I want to hear you drag a chair. Do it while I'm on the phone with you. Drag a chair over to the door and put it under the door. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Daddy's little oh girl. I, I, I mean, oh my God, I was. It's crazy like, all the wild thoughts, but okay, you know. Dad, just to humor you. Yeah, can you hear? I can't hear it. Do it. I'm like, okay. I'm scraping the chair really loud. The girl there was no, uh, you oh know, face, uh, you know, FaceTime and Google oh. Hangout and stuff like that because you'd be sitting up there. Oh, and seriously. Doing it on the phone. Oh, hysterical i mean that was you know maybe six years ago so now it's like okay come back alive yes dad but i still have to call him when i get there and when i get home i'm alive yes dad i'm alive okay dad <laughs> but thankfully i um i actually hosted an event um last october for madeiros fashion pr is like a meet and greet event and i really i invited my parents and my close relatives too i'm like you need to see new york now yeah. you need to see and he was i, I think he's kind of chilled out a little bit because he sees it now he's like Okay. <laughs> oh, it was funny. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, it was. I, I still have to call. Like last night, I was in New York this weekend. I, he's like, "Okay, I'm going to be asleep." But text me. I'm like, "Okay, Dad. Okay." <laughs> yeah. So the, now, when did now you know you love fashion things? When are we going to start getting you doing some modeling and getting on the oh runway? Oh my goodness. Um, like, have, so we've, we've had this conversation before. Yes, you have. And, and been, you've done some things. Now. Oh my goodness, you're funny. You know what? It's like. It's not my passion. As much as I love to, I mean, I've been kind of almost like a default model when some models, are, no, I have. You know, sometimes some clients in the past, like some models don't show up, Emma, I need you to wear this. I'm like, okay, walk down there, okay. <laughs> and, and, but the thing is, when you've done it, see, here, here's the trick, and you know this, and I'm going to say this all the time because a lot of times when you do it as well, and everybody knows, obviously, you've been doing this, you're the expert, you got the knowledge, but when you get out there and do it, it's like, Okay, I'm gonna have to sign on a dollar line because this chick does so. yeah, really it, 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 it motivates them, and you find out more about yourself than do when you do it because you can obviously you, go, you put in your mind because now when you're presenting this, you also now you're in the mindset of the same mindset of every single male female well, that's doing this uh, field goes through, and it is easier for you to articulate yourself in the business. Oh yeah, and I want to say too, I, I think it's really important to say this. No matter how successful you get, no matter how long you've been in business, you never know everything. Oh, God, amen. You know, there, I, I really had to understand that this was like a growth thing for me. Until maybe like a year ago or something like that, I was always afraid to ask for help, ask for advice from other publicists, from other whatever. Because I'm like, oh, I'm the publicist. I should know everything. Or I should at least appear like I know everything, right? No one knows everything. I couldn't be in business for another 40 years. I'm still going to be growing. I'm still That's the underlying learn. description of a publicist because in PR, publicizing, marketing, even and you and I both know when we sit up and have everything in order, we have a list. When you show up, nothing's <laughs> together. No. Oh, my gosh. Nothing. Okay. Murphy's Law. Can we talk about this, please? I mean, so. Murphy's Law applies tenfold when you know planning an event fashion show or something like that I, I, that's why you know a lot of my clients they're like why are you ask because i always ask questions about potential problems well it didn't happen i'm like i want to know in case it happens <laughs> i try to exactly. in what the day, i try to, to have, oh yeah. There's a there's a definite there's a word I want to throw out there and I want you to, uh, and I want you to go with it once I say this word. Okay. In ingenuity. Okay. And if it, how much of that plays a role in being able to adapt, you know, uh, within this field? A lot. You have to go with the flow. You know, there's no set formula for success. There's mm. no, even though, you know, I have a, have a couple plus models as clients, so you would think they're both plus models. I follow the same thing for both of them, right? Nope. They both have different looks, different goals, different everything. There's no check, check, checklist. Okay, yep, yeah, millionaire, we're good. Sit back. 
Nope. Yeah, exactly. No, so what I do, um, if, if I may, explain a little bit about my process. Please. Um, because a lot of people ask me, okay, so what can you do for me? I can't answer that until you, you tell me what you want to do. Mm -hmm. So tell me your goals in the next, say, 6 to 12 months. And if you're not sure, I'm going to ask you some questions to kind of, like, determine that. So I go over my list of services, um, which you can find on my website. I'll, I'll give the link later. And, you know, depending on your goals, your budget, of course, and everything like that, then I'm going to tailor something for you. I'm going to send you a proposal. How does it sound? And then once you sign on, okay, so here's the plan. I'm going to say, okay, here's what we can do every week, every month, whatever, to reach your goals. So it's very, I try to be as methodical as possible, but you always have to be willing to step back and evaluate. So one thing that I make sure to do with all my clients is a monthly status report. So I send you exactly what I worked on for you that month. We talk about it. Okay, so what worked? What didn't work? What worked really well? Let's try this. Let's try that. It's so important. It's fluid. That. Be fluid. Be flexible. You know, and if there's something that's not on my list, I always tell people, run it by me anyway. Because chances are I can either help you with or, or, or find someone who can. Okay. Yeah. And that's a very uh, great process so people can understand. And and there's an aspect to this, um, the word that some people don't like it when we say it, but it's the God honest truth. We have to educate our clients. Yes. And, oh, and absolutely. Because, you know, uh, you, you just like how we don't, I'm sorry, at McDonald's, we don't offer steak. You know, we don't offer chicken and nuggets at the steakhouse. So, some do. But, <laughs> you know, the aspect is that we want to make sure that, you know, this is what we offer and you want this. And if you think that we supposed to provide this, but we don't have it, please, we, no offense, feel free to go a different direction. We're more than happy. And hey, we'll give you a list of other people that may or may not have what you want. Yeah. And that, that allows, uh, you know, educating the client because sometimes people have this for uh, thinking of what something's supposed to be, but then reality is something different. Right. I mean, that really transitions into knowing your target market too. Because mm -hmm. the person who's going to go to McDonald's for McNuggets is probably not the same person who's going to go to a steakhouse for a hundred dollar steak. That's, well, that's, you know, I, you know, I'm not going to go to McDonald's, but I'll, I'll buy it. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, but in general, you're right. talking to a different clientele. So I've had to, you know, talk with people, designers again, just as an example, um, who say, "Okay, so I want to make gorgeous plus size clothes for every age, every income type, every." List. It, a 20-year-old girl is not going to wear the same thing as an 80-year-old woman. No, by far. No, yeah, as much as you ladies. can about your target market. Again, I have a marketing degree. I'm very good at doing research. If you don't know about your target market, I can help you determine that. I can help you say this is their income. This is where they live. This is their lifestyle. Do they have kids? Do they have a home? Do they travel? Like, there are so many questions. Psychographics, too. So demographics are more of, like, facts about income level, that sort of thing. Psychographics is more about their beliefs, their preferences, you know, that sort of thing. Because the psychographics affect a big time because, see, what a 20, what what it means, we used to have a seven-year window, now it's like a really a two- to three-year window of what matters to a 20-year-old, like we're in 2017, what matters to a 20-year-old in 2015 is different than in 2017. Okay. So you have to, you have to uh, offer that uh, level of uh, cycle, you know, and, and that's, we just say in 20, but it matters in all ages. Yeah. And I think some people, when they do their videos, their entertainment or marketing or just in their business, they, you, they lack the ability to grow. How you start a business in 1985 and 2000 to 2015 is different. Yeah. Now, the standard business practice, yes, but overall is different. Yeah. And you have to be willing to adjust and change in that manner. Yes, and I also want to make it clear, too, when you are starting a business or even if you have a business, there's one question that I always ask people. That's almost like my little secret formula I'm sharing here. Um, and I'll preface it by saying one of my college professors a long time ago, he told us a story of when he was job hunting in his 20s for whatever job it was. He went in to prepare to answer typical interview questions, you know, what are your strengths, weaknesses, that sort of thing that we all learn to do. Mm -hmm. so instead, this guy sits him down. He goes, so, what makes you so effing special? And he didn't censor, being nice. And my professor was like, uh, 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 like, 
what he was completely caught off guard. What do you say to that? I, that wasn't on the list of questions to prepare for, you know, what do you say to that? So the guy goes, okay, thank you very much. You can leave now. Goodbye. Mm. End of interview. A little bit brutal, a little, little unexpected, but that just stuck with me so much that just that one question is so important to be able to answer because whether you are a publicist, a designer, a plumber, whatever you are, that's essentially what people want to know. Why am I hiring you? Why am I buying your clothes? Why am I shopping at your store? Why? And so many people can't answer that question. You need to have a definitive answer to it. Like I'm the first plus si I'm the first plus size fashion PR firm in the US. Boom. And the thing is, I've done the research to back that up. I can say that with confidence, right? Be sure before you make a categorical statement like that, you can back it up. Um, and it's really important to know that because on my end as a publicist, when I you are my client, say again you're a design client, I'm reaching out to journalists, to bloggers, to whatever, they get hundreds of emails every day. I asked my contact at Glamour, one of my contacts, she goes, oh, on average, about 400 emails a day. Average. They don't have time to open 95% of them. You mm -hmm. have that subject line and that's it to grab their attention. And, you know, and I don't, take, yeah, I mean, I don't take on, I want to make this clear too, I don't take on just any clients. You know, I know it sounds snobby, but I have to make sure you're doing something different you're doing something, you know, newsworthy in the it, You're willing to put in the effort yes. and, and, and follow. Don't say it doesn't work unless you followed all the steps. Okay, and let's try. It doesn't, try, you know, there are no, yeah, there are no guarantees in PR. I've had people say, okay, so if I give you $1,000 a month, how many media hits will that get me? No. I'm like, no. that's not how it works, honey. <laughs> no, the only thing guarantee is that you can easily, you can mess up faster than you can grow yeah. again. But again, that's why I have that status support. That's why I'm constantly calling, you know, so I can guarantee that I will work my heart out for you. That I can guarantee. Yeah. Amen. Now, I will um, want start off and, and ask you a couple of things okay. because I know our time is short sure. and things, you know, it takes the time to count all the money in your bank account, I know. <laughs> Got a couple million left to verify. Oh, yeah. for the sure, let's go with that. Uh, <laughs> what uh, What would you tell Emma when she turned eighteen and when she graduated high school? What you would tell her now that you wish you could tell her then? You know, back then. What if I? You know, I wish I'd known then. Oh man, I I would definitely say look at the word no as next opportunity. I, I don't remember where I heard that quote one time. It's not mine. I wish I could take credit for it. Um, but I'm really glad that I did because you're going to hear no. You're going to hear no, especially if you start your own business. You can't do that. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't blah, 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 negative, negative, negative. If it is your passion, go for it. You know, not every business idea is going to work out. But the thing is, if something doesn't work out and you're really passionate about it, step back from it and say, okay, how can I fulfill my passion in a different way and make it work? Because nobody goes into their own business unless they love it or they no. shouldn't. You're going to be up at the crack of dawn. You're going to be up till 2 a.m. the night before. You're going to work 24-7. You're going to miss parties. You're going to do whatever. You don't do that unless you love it. So really do what you love, essentially. And I know that sounds corny, but it's so true. You know, my dad, you know, it, it is very practical. He's like, you should get into healthcare. There's always going to be a job there, nursing, whatever. He, he did that because he cared about me. Because he, he's like, I want to see you safe. I want to see you that's what they know because that's what they know yes in the world to give me a check you go watch and yeah, go home exactly you know what you have coming in every week you know what you have yet like and you know obviously there are benefits to that i'm not saying there's not believe me there have been times that i you know i remember when i was younger i was so broke i had to live on popcorn for a whole day that's all i had i was getting paid the next day but i'm like i have nothing to eat except popcorn and i have zero money you do what you need to do you know what you do what you need to do really don't don't take that I mean take take feedback with a grain of salt you want to listen to your support system because they care about you they love you do you always have to do everything that they say no I would listen to it consider it but don't necessarily blindly follow their advice 
you know, your family, your support system, yes. You know, especially me. Again, I have an amazing family. Do I always take their advice? No. Do I always consider it? Yes. Amen. Yeah. Uh, one, two aspects regarding in um, marketing, and I say this towards uh, plus size industry. I pray for the day that we can get out the word using plus size as just still say model for everybody, um, to be honest, because I don't want it to be seen like a celebratory in some sense, because I don't want to dismay all the work that everybody's done to uh, get to this level. But now that we're here, there's this level of... Uh, I have arrived. I don't have to work. We have arrived and we don't have to work as hard anymore. And I see that when, uh, you know, some of the plus size, okay, I'm modeling, whatever, but I don't want to work out. Uh, even though if you're plus size, you still need to work out for the health, the conditioning, uh, to get the tone, all these other different things that make it work for yourself. But some have this level of like, we have arrived, so we don't have to do this fight anymore. And that's not the case. No, if anything, we have to fight more. Exactly. Because while, yes, it's amazing. Sorry, I'm a little cold. <laughs> a little bit of a sniffle. Um, while it's amazing that the industry is growing and everything, the flip side of that is that there's more competition. Again, goes back to that question, what makes you so effing special? Because, you know, even five years ago, there would maybe be 50 models at a casting call. Now there's 500. You've got to differentiate yourself. You know, if anything, we need to work harder because the industry is growing, because there's more competition. Mm, very much so. A uh, couple of uh, wordplay for you. Uh, favorite color? <laughs> Gee, I have no idea. <laughs> That's purple. <laughs> uh, your favorite, your favorite song. Oh man, one of my favorites because I remember I have a music background, so quite a few. That's one of my good. favorites is Christina Aguilera, "Fighter." Okay, love that song. I mean, it it applies on so many levels. I mean, I first got into it when I was in high school. I was going through a breakup, and I'm like fighter it makes me stronger okay you know i can live through this um but it also really applies to business as well you know so in really different aspects of your life not just relationship but definitely christina aguilera fighter yep if uh, what's your favorite song that you can sing well i can sing a lot yeah i mean i, I have a pretty r wide range because i was um trained as a classical singer right, so i'm pretty right. versatile i guess my favorite song to sing is oh man it's it's by um, a group called Manhattan Transfer. Ah, uh, very group. good. And it's a song called Operator. I love that song. Yes. And I actually sang that in one of my three choruses in high school. I was in a jazz chorus. Um, and we sang that. I love that song. So it's like upbeat. It's fun. It's catchy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What if, what would be, uh, and, I'm, and there's a musical aspect to all of this. Uh, if you could play an instrument, what instrument would that be? Hmm. Probably a stringed instrument. Yeah. Like one oh, okay. you're cheating. Come on now. <laughs> Specifically. Um, I guess viola. Viola, oh. which is like a lot of people don't know they know violin. Viola is like a little bit deeper, a little bit more like sensuous sounding. It's very sensual. Oh, it's just like it's adds so much to it. Like one of my another one of my favorite songs is um Jessica Simpson, You Don't Have to Let Go. And I actually recorded it one time. For my mother as a gift and I, i'm sorry <laughs> i get emotional when i talk about it because i'm sorry <laughs> i didn't expect it oh that's a, that's a beautiful um, thing please it's basically saying um i don't need your strength anymore because you've made me strong i'm sorry <laughs> No problem. It's okay. It's okay. It's, I'm really it's, sorry. It's, that came out of nowhere. No, oh, there's my kitty. Bad. One of my kitties in the background. <laughs> hey, kitty. Hi, kitty. She's like, are you done yet? Time to feed me. Um, but the reason why I love that song so much, not only because of the lyrics, but like the strings and the viola and the violin just like add so much passion to it. Sorry. What, that's no problem. <laughs> I'm like, what wow, did, that came out of nowhere. <laughs> what did you do with your first $100? Oh, Oh, well, my very first job was as a hostess at Cello's, which was in a, uh, which is a restaurant in Rhode Island. So, oh, what did I do? I think I went, like, shop I know, I know I went shopping. Um, but I was like, damn, I got my own money. Cool. I think I probably brought, like, a CD or something. I honestly don't remember. But it was, it was definitely cool to say, you know, see on a paycheck with, you know, 
God knows how I many pennies now, obviously. Um, but that was a talk about an accomplished feeling. That was cool. Yeah. If you, you know, um, if you have a daughter right now, a, a, a 14, 15 year old daughter right now, what would, or let's say she's just about to, she's graduating and she's about to run out the house. What is like something you did that you don't want her to do and that you're going to want her? Well, you know what? This answer is probably going to surprise you. I would want her to not necessarily have sex, but okay. be more open about her sexuality. Okay. And I know that most parents are going to be like, oh, you know, oh my gosh, 14. I'm not saying to have sex, to mm -hmm. talk about it. You know, I grew up in a very conservative Catholic I was afraid of boys. I was terrified. Oh my gosh. I, I mean, like, they didn't have, my parents did not have to worry about me getting pregnant. I was terrified of going anywhere near boys. But that's a dangerous way because now right. when somebody. It's danger in and of itself. Panic. So I would definitely say, you know, talk to your mom about how you're feeling, how you're developing. You know, we don't want to think about teenagers having sex. That's the time when you're most, your hormones are going nuts. That's when you're, I mean, like, even if you don't have sex, you're thinking about it boy or girl so I wouldn't necessarily say have sex don't get me wrong I didn't lose my virginity until I was 22 but what I am saying is talk to your parents or if, if you really feel that you can't talk to an adult that you can trust ask about birth control options even if you're not having sex now know your options and also know about relationships you know it's an because it's very easy to get caught up, especially your first love. Oh my gosh. It's this amazingly overpowering feeling. Oh my gosh. You just, it's like nothing else, you know, like nothing else. And you want to give yourself to that person and you know, they might even feel the same way. I'm not saying boys are awful. They're about to take advantage. Of you. No, but you know what? Know yourself, know yourself as well as you can at 14. You know, mm. talk to your friends, but also talk to an adult that you trust, whether it's your parents a guidance counselor, whatever, you know, is this normal? Is it normal that I want to, I, you know, I'm going to say the word masturbate. Is that normal? You know, I want to talk about stuff like this because everybody talks about it amongst themselves, but not out loud. Exactly. It is a normal thing to don't have. Don't let it be a taboo. Feeling. Don't let it be a taboo. Don't let it be a scary, you know, by like anything else, fear comes from ignorance. I really believe that. Whether it's about sex, whether it's about race, whether it's about culture, religion, fear comes from ignorance. If you take that ignorance away, it's like, oh, it's not so scary. Oh, okay. All right. I really, I feel so strongly about that. You know, I really wish someone had said that to me. Yeah. Instead, it was just, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> last, last question for you. Your favorite book. I... Let's see. I'm a bookworm. I'm definitely a bookworm. Um, I guess if I had to pick one, I would say The Good Earth. Mm. Did you ever read that by Pearl F. Fox? I, it, but I'm not, I can't remember. It was, I mean, it was, it was actually required reading in high school, and I hated it in high school, probably because I was forced to read it. I mean, if you're told to read something, you know what, you know, for pleasure. But I've read it often since then, and I think the reason why I'm drawn to it is because it was based in, it was, I don't know the actual year, but it was pre-revolutionary China. And it was very, you know, you look at it now, it's like completely anti-feminist. Like the woman was there, she was submissive to the man, to have sons, nothing more. Mm. Right? I don't know why I'm drawn to that. Maybe because it's so different than how it is now, but also because the book is really written from the point of view of the husband. And it's very interesting to see how his view on his wife and later his concubine and his children and everything change. Um, one, especially his first daughter. The first, he had two sons at first, and of course that's good fortune, good luck, sons, of course that's what you want to have. When his daughter first her, his first daughter was born, it's an evil omen. Oh my gosh, everything's gonna go wrong now. And it's interesting because his daughter later on was the one that he was the most bonded to and he felt the closest to. And it's sad because she was born in a time where they um, were undergoing a famine. So the author doesn't really get into why she never learned to talk, why she couldn't talk, but she was probably what we would call severely autistic today. 
And at one point they were so poor. I mean, I'm talking hadn't eaten in weeks. I mean, we think poor, a completely different definition. And with them, I mean, they're literally starving to death and there are no social welfare. There's no options. Even if you had money, there's no food to buy, right? So this poor girl, she um, was somehow developmentally disabled where later on they found out she couldn't talk and they had considered at one point selling her. I mean, that was acceptable then to sell a child, to get food, to get money, something, right? And later on, he realized, oh my God, they would have killed you if they found you this way. They probably would have developmentally disabled. They were left out to die, killed outright. That's what they did, you know, back then. And I just think it's such a contrast to, thankfully, how that is today. Um, and another one of my favorite books as well is um, Her Land. It was written in 1920s by Charlotte Perkins. And it was basically about a utopia of women. So these three men, these three explorers, they stumbled onto a land, a very small land, about 3,000 people of women, only women, no men, that had somehow procreated asexually without men for 2,000 years. And they're like, how is this possible? I don't understand, right? And yes, even though it was fiction, it's almost like a communistic society, but the good portions of it. They thought as a community. At one point in the book, the woman's, the woman's one of the men asked the woman, why do you always say we feel this way instead of I feel this way? She goes, I think in we's, we's. I think for the good of the community. I think for the good of us. Because if something benefits me and not my sisters, not my mothers, not my daughters, what good is it? You know, and that's so contradictory to especially American or any capitalist society. It's all about the individual. So something like that was very eye-opening. Whether it actually will work in real life, who knows? You know, it was fiction. But, I mean, probably on a small scale, not a big scale, but it was very eye-opening to think about it differently. That's a beautiful thing. It really is. Tell it's us, very, I, I encourage people to read it. Tell us uh, how can people get in contact with your name, address, phone number, lottery numbers, what have you. Lottery numbers, sure, yeah. Um, so my name is Emma Medeiros. So M as in Mary, E, D as in dog, E, I, R, O, S. Uh, MedeirosFashionPR.com. I can be found on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, everything. My email is Emma at MedeirosFashionPR.com, and all of these links are through my website. Um, and please reach out to me. And I always tell people, whether or not you're in the market for the publicist right now, a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to waste your time because I can't afford you right now. I don't care. Talk to me. Let's start this relationship. You know, that way when you are ready later on, I already know Emma. She knows me. We have a plan. There we go. Saves you a ton of time. So please reach out to me, even if you just want to learn more about PR. What does that mean? I mean, a lot of people don't really understand what PR does. I mean, I talked about it a little bit here, but there's more to say, obviously. Um, so please encourage people. Also, I want to make it clear, too, I don't just represent plus sizes. I represent brands that carry all sizes, too. Because I don't want to exclude the smaller girls, or guys, for that matter. Um, you know, so if you have a brand that has, you know, say, from extra small to 3X, whatever, oh, Emma only does plus size. No, call me. It's all good. That'll be perfect. Yeah. And we'll make sure, since you're going to New York, we'll get you a Yankees versus a Red Sox. Oh, my Thursday. God. My dad would pass out if he heard me say that. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I, I, oh. I'm going to take a picture. <laughs> and I'm going to send it to the video and be like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna be like, thanks, Dad. Oh, <laughs> out of his will. Oh my gosh, no, no, no. <laughs> well, it's it's actually kind of sad because even though I live in Boston, I'm really not into sports. The only time I know that there's a game going on is if I see a bunch of people like in Red Sox stuff on the train. I'm like, oh, guess there's a tra you know, guess there's a game here. <laughs> you know. Oh, you, you you you're not gonna live that long before I get into. It. You're going to New York. You're gonna have to get into it at some point. I yeah. know, I know. Do I yeah, know? A, lot a lot of business deals are done in that you know that sports box, you know. <laughs> but Miss Emma, thank you from the bottom of my heart, or from yeah, everybody of the live and so yeah. live and global media, and myself personally, I thank you so very much for your time. I appreciate. It. I'll send your check in the mail, and uh, I'll please everybody make sure. You contact Ms. Madeira. Even if you want to learn more information, please reach out to me. 
And I will. And also, just a little tip. Um, I think I mentioned this in the beginning, but I am going to be launching a video series. I haven't determined the details yet um, about little tips and tricks for PR. Um, so stay tuned on that. Oh, we're going to love this. Yeah. Uh, thank you so very thank kindly. You so much. Everybody, please make sure you give us a call at uh, for Live and Global Media at 804-220-9551. You can also email us at enlivengm, as E-N-L-I-V-E-N-G-M at gmail.com. Uh, thank you so very kindly. You can watch a uh, series of our videos on Fire Talk and also on YouTube. Uh, thank you very kindly. And may you all please have a blessed day. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.